It was clear that we can't uh, get the invitation while the war is going on. But what we have is si still a clear pathway to membership. What is important to understand is that uh, the big allies are also taking this very, very seriously. And that is a good sign that we are so into you know, every word because they also want to deliver. So actually, that is a good sign on the path to membership. We have several things. Uh, we have the Ukraine uh, NATO Council that works as an article for, uh, for members of the alliance, uh, where you have the consultations uh, with the uh, uh, ally, uh, allies when you want them. Uh, second, we uh, get rid of the map, and and third, we're going to have a, a, you know constant nudging by the foreign ministers, you know, every every year uh, to uh, see the progress and tick the boxes where they already have met the criteria so that when the opportunity window comes, and that is always a very short opportunity window, then we can, you know, go on with the membership like we did with Finland and Sweden. Finland and Sweden, absolutely, but in a very different situation as well. Why then, if you think this is actually really good progress for the situation when the war ends as well, especially regarding membership, is Mr. Zelensky calling the current situation unprecedented? He's calling it absurd. He's saying why, are, why is the future of Ukraine potentially being negotiated away at a later date uh, as the price of progress? I understand the frustration of President Zelensky. I mean, he wants uh, his country to be at peace like we are, who are, we are in NATO because we have the uh, NATO's uh, security umbrella over us. But uh, this is uh, as far as we can get right now because they are uh, in a war and nobody wants this war to go any further. Um, so, so this is what we achieve uh, to be on the pathway to tick the boxes to the conditions uh, that are there. and when when uh, the moment comes when they are able to defend uh, themselves so that Russia is pushed back to Russia, the opportunity window is there and then the membership can happen. Are we spending enough money? I, and I think I know the answer from your point of view, and that is no, because I've seen you speaking already today about we need to get to 2%, but then we need to go further as well. A lot of countries, including the big ones you've mentioned, some of them are struggling to get to 2%. Is there going to be a firm commitment at this meeting that 2% is a meaningful 2% and we can go further from that? Uh, yes, that was the agreement. I mean, uh, the, the defence investment pledge uh, that was there uh, 10 years ago was uh, sort of a uh, recommendation and not the obligation, but now we have agreed to this obligation. It was also very hard to get there because some allies have much better neighbours than we do, so, so maybe the threat is not that real. But as I was pointing out, in 1988, all of the allies were ma ma investing 2% of their uh, GDP to defence because the threat was real and the threat is real now we have a conventional war uh, being uh, raging in in Europe and we have to prepare for that and that takes time so uh, that needs money and that needs also the investments in equipment ammunition in order to be ready to deter Russia you talked about progress of the big powers and I, I guess we can talk about the big military powers of uh, UK France Germany and US the latter two especially in terms of changing their mindset as well. Do you have the same fear that many have, that actually a change of leadership in the United States could mean oscillation in those security guarantees, could mean a lessening of the commitments of the United States uh, to Ukraine and to Europe? I hope not. I have had uh, meetings with uh, both sides of the aisle, so uh, Republicans as well as Democrats, and, and they, uh, they both have very strong voices in supporting Ukraine. So I hope that that doesn't change even if the leadership of uh, US changes. Uh, but it's also important to have these bilateral agreements you know, uh, defined somewhere, uh, written down, so that uh, the obligations are for the country and not uh, for uh, the administration only. Final question for me. You are uh, a keen observer of what's going on with Mr. Putin and Russia. No one knows what's going on inside the Kremlin. But recent events, do you think his position looks weakened from your point of view, from what you can see, from the intelligence you're getting? Regarding uh, dictators, it's uh, what keeps them in power is the cronies around them happy, uh, the army and the power structures happy, and eliminating all the alternatives, so the opposition. Uh, what we are seeing, uh, the mutiny of Prigozhin and what he said out, is that army is not happy. Uh, so, uh, I mean, that shows that uh, some elements of this um, 
elements that keep dictator in power are you know fragmented or, or weaker but I, I wouldn't read anything into this I mean it's an internal matter that goes on in Russia it doesn't change our resolve uh, that we have to support Ukraine as long as they are able to push back Russia to Russia Hi, I'm Joanna Bersacci and thank you for watching. You can check out more of our videos by clicking on the boxes on the screen. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more from CNBC International. Thank you for watching.